man, it's beautiful down here in Florida. I'm so enjoying this part of the world. And you can see just behind me, it's so peaceful. There's some birds out over there. Uh, every once in a while, you'll see some ducks down here who will walk past as they head on down to the pond that's here on my left. Now, now I'm answering questions from the comments at the bottom. And I want to make sure that I keep up with these questions so that you do get a response to the ones, the best ones, the ones who are really asking and are very serious. And there have been some the, concerning the, the emergence or the origins of Islam. How and why did Islam start so suddenly in the 7th century? What was the meaning or what was the impetus behind it? Now, here's one by a fellow or someone named Mati Latvali. Mati Latvali says this, when we assume that Arabs had already conquered all of Spain, to, uh, from Spain to Persia, uh, when the prophet was invented, he says in Antigime, possibly using one to two historical men, what explains this very sudden and enormous military success if they did not have an ideology fueling it? No flag to rally under. Terrific question. This is repeated similarly by Tim Kaine. More recently, he says this, and I'm going to read his because he, he, he expands on this, asking much the same question. Tim Kaine says this, While the work on variants is good and valid and should yield fruit in determining Islam, and the same holds true for Dan Gibson's work, it doesn't mean that Jay's position that Malik invented Islam in 680, actually 692 I think is the better date, is correct. The Notre Dame scholar of religious studies, Gabriel said Reynolds, uh, postulates that Arab identity emerged before Muhammad, as probably did at least some of the Quran. And this, he says, may have been the impetus. Moreover, he goes on to say, the Arab armies were deep into North Africa, or the Arabian Peninsula, and the Iranian Plateau. Something propelled them. Something caused the Arabs to suddenly cohere, to create large armies, engage in vigorous expansion, constant battle, and expansion outward long before the Malik came along. So he's echoing what Mati Latvala said, but expanding more upon that and saying, what is that impetus? You can't just say it's one man named Abdul Malik that started this whole thing. And I would agree with both of you, Mati and Tim Kaine. Absolutely. No one suggests that this there was not an impetus behind it. No one would suggest, and I've never suggested, that, uh, that Abdul Malik is the one that created Islam. Please, please, if I have, you know, I stand corrected. I stand corrected. I would never suggest uh, that, that uh, uh, Abdul Malik created Islam. No, he didn't. He created this, he basically took this Arab identity. And remember, I've said this over and over again, so has Mel from Sneakers Corner. We have said this, we've repeated this, that this idea of an Arab identity began, began much, much earlier, much, much earlier, way back in around 622. In 622 is when Heraclius defeated the Sassanids, and the Sassanids are the Persians. The Persians were way off in the east. Remember, they were the ones way off in the east that had really controlled the Arabs, and the Arabs were under their yoke for centuries. And when the Byzantines under Heraclius then finally defeated the Sassanids, and remember, who was part of that? Ilyas ibn Kabisa, nicknamed Muhammad, was part of that helping out to confront and destroy the Sassanids. He then turned is and turned also on the Byzantines, but he was way over in Hira doing that in 618 up until 622. So that started much, much earlier. And that's why I believe, this is my own personal belief, that 622 became so important uh, as far as a date. And that's why 622 was then borrowed by the Abbasids later on as the time for the Hijrah. But nonetheless, let, so this identity began once the Arabs now were under, uh, were no longer under the oak of the Sassanids. Now they were really had their own control and they started expanding their borders. And you had the Lachmids, especially over in Hira. And the Ghassanids up here in the north, they were, uh, they were the ones who then moved out and they started expanding their empire. Then you have finally the Umayyad Caliphate comes into power in 661 under the authority of Mu'awiyah, who lives in Damascus. Damascus, way up in the north. 
Damascus. And he expands the borders. So by the end of his lifetime, um, I'm sorry, by the end of his reign in 680, all the way in uh, the west in Tripoli, all the way to Afghanistan in the east was under his control. So from 660 up to 670, up to 680, you have this expanding empire, the Umayyad empire, and they are Arab. You're right, they are Arab, but they aren't Muslims. Let me repeat that, Tim Kaine. They aren't Muslims because you're going to make this mistake in the next thing you say. Nowhere is there any reference that they were Muslims. And this is what we have said over and over. Look at the coins. There's no reference that these people are Muslims. In fact, as we've said over and over again, in the West they are Christians, in the East they are Zoroastrians. Look at the coins. Look at the religious reference points. Look at the icons on the coins and you will see these are not at all Muslims. They are Christians and Zoroastrians. So when Abdul Malik comes into power in 685, in 685, his greatest, basically his greatest threat are the Byzantines. Justinian II, his greatest threat, politically speaking. He's in Damascus. So right north of him are the Byzantines, the Byzantine Empire. So his whole ethos, his whole, you might say, Irv, he's no longer, there's no Sassanids, there are no Persians anymore. They were destroyed back in 620. This is, uh, we're talking about 60 years later, even more than that. Now we're talking about 70 years later. He is not concerned at all uh, with the Sassanids. He is concerned with the Byzantines. He is concerned with the Byzantines. Not only is he concerned with them politically, he's also concerned with them theologically. Why? Because he is an Arab. He has his roots in the Abrahamic traditions, like the Byzantines do. The Christians and the Jews, they also go back to Abraham. So does he. But unlike the Christians and Jews who have a revelation called the Bible and have a prophetic line from the line of Isaac, he doesn't. He doesn't. Abdul Malik doesn't have this, uh, this type of identity. He doesn't have near the identity as those he is now responsible for and in charge of and has authority over all these Christians and Jews. Yet he is a cousin to them, but they have a scriptural identity. They have a religious identity that he doesn't. That he doesn't. Now can you understand why he builds that huge building, the Dome of the Rock? Here's a picture of it, right smack dab in the middle of Jerusalem. And he starts that identity. He creates that we are now the new people on the block. We are now the kingdom that expands all the way from uh, Tripoli in the west, all the way to Afghanistan in the east, and is now even increasing its borders. But we don't have the religious identity that you have, you Christians. Or you Jews. So he goes right back, slapped down right to their most important city in Jerusalem. And he builds the greatest structure of its day, the Dome of the Rock. Looking down on the Church of the Sepulcher, where the Christians are going for their pilgrimage. Now, he, you can remember his pilgrimage is still down to Petra. So why didn't he build this building in Petra? Because this is a political statement. This is a theological statement. This is a religious one-upmanship against the Christians, especially the Byzantine Christians, especially he's rubbing his nose at Justinian II. And more than that, he then introduces his coins to mock, to mock Justinian II and puts his own image on the coin in 693 with a sword. Basically, it's a declaration of war. So both politically and theologically, he is attacking Byzantine Christianity. And that's why, that's why once that happens, now he didn't invent Islam. He didn't even, he used, started using the name Islam. He is the first one to use that name. He is the first one to use the word Muslim. But it did take root. It didn't really become a entity until much, much later, until around 730s and 740s, when it then became the name for these people who now have a new what they considered to be a new monotheistic religion in contradistinction to what they thought was polytheistic, polytheistic beliefs, especially on the person of Jesus Christ. And that's why they call them the associators. Even Abdul Malik puts that on his coins and he puts it on the Dome of the Rock. The Shahada, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, that means you have that reference that the associators built into the Shahada, 
That means us. We are the associators. Look at John of Damascus. He comes out in the 700s and he talks about himself as the reference point, as the associators, according to you. He doesn't believe he's an associator with God. He's not done any of this work. Neither do we today. But the Arabs, those who then became the Muslims, considered these people, others, the Christians especially, to be the associators. So be careful. Abdul Malik didn't invent it. He just introduced this new identity. That's why on the coins, on the Dome of the Rock, and on the Caliphal Protocols that he introduces in 691 and in 692, he introduces the name Muhammad. He introduces his prophet. Obviously, once you introduce the prophet, in contradistinction to the Christian view of that Jesus was God, then you've got to have a book for that prophet. That's why the Quran starts to get formed about that time. And let's move on because you didn't talk about this. Going back to Tim Keynes, he continues and he says, Moreover, the North Africans were Muslims and moved on into Spain. They were all Muslims before Malik. Oh, Tim Cain, I want to ask you one question. I hope you're watching this. Come back to me on this. Where did you get this idea that the North Africans were Muslims? Do you have any reference for anybody called Muslims prior to 692? Whether they're North Africans or Eastern Africans or anybody from Jordan or Syria or Iraq or even Arabia, are there any people called Muslims prior to 692? You just blurt it out there, but you have no reference at all. Where did you get this idea that they were Muslims? Help me here. Convince me. Convince all of us. Show me one reference to people called Muslims prior to 692. We've said this over and over again. There is no reference to anybody called Muslims that early. Then you go on to say, I think our general narrative holds up. That the places are, uh, are different than their traditional account, but that's about it. Mu'awiyah, you say, and his generation fought Muhammad for 20 years. Mu'awiyah first only comes into power in 661. Where is there any reference that he's fighting a man named Muhammad? Can you show me? Where does he even mention Muhammad? So where are you getting these ideas from? What you're doing is you're doing the Islamic dance. You're doing the Islamic dance that everybody does. You're going back to the traditions to get what you're talking about. See, here you say, you, you say that we've got the narrative right, generally. However, you're missing a few points. How about Mu'awiyah? He was fighting Muhammad. So where are you getting that from? See, the whole, if you want to understand our premise, Tim Cain, Throw out those traditions. Why are you going back then to now recreate the story? You're contradicting yourself. You can't have it both ways. You can't say your narrative is correct, Jay and Mel and uh, uh, Robert Spencer and all the others who are now coming on board. You can't say the narrative, your narrative, that there is a problem here with the 7th and 8th century. We can't find any reference to people called Muslims, any religion called Islam, any people, any person called Muhammad, or any place called Mecca, or any book called the Quran. Those are the five things we can't find reference for. And then you start to say, well, actually, in 661 was attacking Muhammad for 20 years. Where'd that come from? Where did you get that notion from? From the Islamic tradition. So you're going back to the Islamic tradition to repeat what you have always been told and you don't know how to get beyond it. It's a common problem, Tim. Don't worry about it. And that is, you say one thing, but then you completely contradict yourself in the very next statement. You cannot do that and held and be held justifiably or to be consistent and then you go on and say that uh, he he fought muhammad for 20 years listen we wasn't even there muhammad died in 632 we didn't come into part in 660 so even that reference doesn't make sense that's 30 years after muhammad was dead he comes to power so how could he fight him muhammad's been dead for 30 years nonetheless though he was a charlatan and hated him despite liking uh, liking to receive muhammad's empire when Mu'awiyah's generation died out, that's around 680, or, then the next generation was more accepting and glorifying of Muhammad and the promotion of Islamic chauvinism. My opinion on you. Listen, Dick, if you're going to have an opinion like that, at least use historical evidence and stop defaulting back onto the Islamic traditions. 
That's the Islamic dance. And that's what we've said over and over and over again. Do not waste our time with the Islamic tradition. And for heaven's sake, say our narrative makes sense. However, I have a few problems with it because we was fighting Muhammad. First of all, that's historically incorrect on both the traditional account and also on our account. You can't have uh, someone fighting someone who's been dead for 30 years. And secondly, be careful that you don't confuse the two. Either you're going to go with the historical record, either you're going to go with the evidences on the ground, or you're going to spend all your time just mimicking and narrating and copying what the Islamic traditions from the 9th and 10th century say, redacted back onto the 7th century. Be careful. Don't do that, because once you do that, then you're going to not going to be able to come up to any conclusions. You'll be laughed out of court. I'm not laughing at you now, but I am saying, be careful. Do not do that Islamic dance, because in doing that, you just discredit your whole theory and you just discredit your whole premise. God bless you. Nonetheless, thanks for bringing that up and realize that this is something that did not happen overnight. Now, what Muslims want us to believe, what the Islamic tradition starts from its premise is that all of Islam as we know it today, including all the laws, all the traditions, <coughs> all the schools of law, all of this was created at the time of Muhammad. So that everything Muslims are to do and say and all their theological precepts were created in that 22 year period from 610 to 632. Can you now see the problem with that? Can you now see the problem with that? Because all these laws and institutions and all these references to cities and places and names and dates do not make sense in the 7th century at all. They just don't exist. These theologies and this biography and the sayings don't even begin to appear in the 9th century. They did not exist in a 22-year period. They were not created over a 22-year period like Muslims like us to believe. Two to three hundred year period, that makes sense. And almost all of it, much too far north and much too late. Remember, I have been saying this for 25 years. You're finally getting it, some of you, but you still can't get rid of those Islamic traditions. You still fall back onto them to try to explain the world around you without even thinking not only how inconsistent it is, but how it does not fit the historical record. Oh, it's so good to be able to stand on the historical record and to be held accountable by the historical record. Always, always, always show me evidence on the ground. Show me any Arabs from North Africa that call themselves Muslims. Show me any reference that Mu'awiyah even knew the name Muhammad, at least the Muhammad, Muhammad of the traditions. You're not going to find it. Show me any city called Mecca that he prayed towards. You're not going to find it. Show me any train routes that even went through that city. You're just not going to have you know, be able to find it. And that's why we're putting up these videos to help you understand that the, the evidence on the ground, the historical evidence that we are using in almost every category is resolute in its authority. Come on home. Come on home to the evidence on the ground. That's all I ask. Be historically correct and stick to it. God bless you. This is Jay in this, on this beautiful day here in Central Florida, where I am for this time period. Over and out.